Hi there, March 7th today. And I have a lot of anniversaries to cover. And um, some of them I have a lot of information, but I'm just going to cover all of them fairly briefly because I didn't get a recording done in advance and I had to get ready for work. But the, the oldest death we have today was from 1875. 20-year-old um, Antoinette died on that day at the home of a New York midwife slash abortionist because she made that her business, Catherine Maxwell. And the news coverage of the coroner's inquest gets us a real glimpse into how these abortion deaths were seen. It's not that you pay your money and you take your chances the way we see it today. Um, the abortion, they concluded, had been performed about February 26th. Um, a witness who admitted to having had Maxwell do an abortion on her, so I think she's the one that helped arrange it, and John Betts, the baby daddy, uh, were prosecuted as accomplices. And the Brooklyn Eagle spared no words in its castigation of Betts, saying that he helped her into her grave and cheated a product of love and guilt out of its right to be born. This, the whole coverage is in striking contrast to a modern abortion death case. It, there were no supporters outside the courtroom holding signs saying Mrs. Maxwell helps women like you see when an abortionist nowadays gets prosecuted for patient death. No ad hoc coalition of lobbying and activist groups um, blogging for him. No group of medical students uh, for her. No group of medical students asking her to come speak to them about how she could follow in her footsteps. All the things we see nowadays from the self-proclaimed uh, advocates of women's lives. Uh, back then, you butchered a woman and all you got for your problem was scorn, infamy, and a prison sentence, which I think is as it should be. And we move ahead on in time. We get to 1881. And in this case, a 20-year-old named Mary died in Peekskill, New York, after lingering nearly a year from complications of an abortion that her medical student fiance had performed on her. And I think to try to protect himself, he married her on her deathbed, um, hoping that her testimony, ooh, I need to leave for work soon, hoping that her testimony wouldn't be used against him because of um, marital privilege. Then we move forward to 1908 to New Berlin, Illinois. Um, where a 26-year-old seamstress died at Wesley Hospital. Um, she had gone to a home on Forest Avenue where a 71-year-old midwife named Joanna, Re Joanna White uh, perpetrated the abortion. She was sentenced to a sentence of one to 10 years at Joliet. Uh, she wasn't expected to survive her sentence. Um, we have another situation in 1913 in Chicago. This one was really hard to tease out because it got tangled in with a murder mystery. Um, March 7th, 1913, 16-year-old Edna died of a botched abortion. And shortly thereafter, a man was found beaten to death and in his pocket were a news clipping about Edna's death and the address of um, a female obstetrician. So she was identified as a midwife in a lot of the coverage, even though she was a doctor. Um, so for a while, people thought that this was a revenge killing, that uh, first they thought the baby daddy might have killed him. Um, this guy had a reputation for becoming sexually involved with young women. So they thought that he had actually been the baby daddy and that either Edna's boyfriend or Edna's relatives had killed him in revenge for her death. Excuse me, I have such a cold today. I hate this. Um, but it turned out later that it had something to do with a love triangle involving his wife. And because it wasn't associated with Edna's death, I didn't go to a whole lot of detail figuring out who actually killed him. Um, we move forward to 1919, San Mateo, California. A Red Cross nurse named Inez died after an abortion uh, perpetrated by Dr. Ephraim Northcott. 
who was related to the murderer Gordon Northcott. Um, if you watch the movie Changeling, with it was Angelina Jolie, um, about one of Northcott's victims. Um, Inez's body was dumped into a ravine, and that's how her body was discovered, and that's how the abortion was discovered. And, you know, that sadly did happen. Um, of course, it happened because it was murder when you killed a woman that she would hide the body. I've only found one safe and legal case where they actually went to the trouble of trying to hide the body. Um, and in that case, it was a non-physician owned the abortion clinic. Her abortionist quit, so she just kept doing abortions and a patient died and she figured she was gonna go to jail for it. So um, she and one of her former employees were caught stuffing the woman's stiffening body into the trunk of her own car to go dump it. That's the only post-legal abortion deaths I found where they tried to dump the body. Uh, move ahead to 1922, and uh, at Wichita, and a 19-year-old named Hattie May died, um, and they conclude that Dr. Charles Keister had perpetrated the abortion, and he was arrested March 10th and charged with two counts of manslaughter, one for Hattie and one for her unborn baby. And he is the second of a series of women. Um, she was the second in a series of women attributed to Keister. Um, one woman died late November, or early December of 1921. Another in December of 23, one in August of 24, another in August of 24. And then uh, Rena, who we covered last month, February 28th of 1930. This was shocking to me when I first started doing research, how many women these abortionists were able to kill. And, you know, we really need to look into how they managed to get away with this and close up those loopholes. And then the most recent one, we jump clear ahead to 1978, as 43-year-old woman named Gloria, who had an abortion performed by Ronald, Ronald Tauber, at Orlando Birthing Center in Orlando, Florida. And this actually was um, a combination birthing center and abortion clinic, which to me is the creepiest thing imaginable. Um, he, it was not classified as a hospital, even though he kept patients overnight because he had so few patients staying. And that was some of the brouhaha afterward is whether um, he should have been more closely monitored. Um, and he talked about how he only did low risk um, pregnancies when he was doing deliveries in the birthing center. Gloria was a very, very high risk abortion. It should, should not have been done outpatient. And he punctured her uterus during the abortion, packed her uterus with gauze, which appeared to have controlled the bleeding. But the next day he removed the packing and she continued hemorrhaging and he didn't transfer her to a hospital until 30 hours after her injury. Um, so a court appointed panel found him negligent in her death. Um, and actually uh, he was dismissed from the staff of two hospitals. His medical license was suspended and he was charged with manslaughter. Um, that was never pursued. He went back to his home state. I think it was Michigan. I'm going to have to blog about this later. I did a little research and haven't had time to write it up, but he later got arrested for molesting children. So he didn't get any more abortion trouble, but he still evidently was no friend to children born or unborn. 